Coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap, we've got the definitive report on the target breach, a flaw in single sign-on that's used all over the net, Level 3 takes it to the broadband monopolies and the tech giants unite to fight for net neutrality, then it's a great big batch of your questions, our answers, and much, much more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Hi everyone, and welcome to TechSnap. This is episode 162 of Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. We stream this episode live on May 8th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by our three fine sponsors, Ting, DigitalOcean, and iX Systems. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this here show goes on. Our live stream is powered by the incredible Scale Engine over at ScaleEngine.com. You've got to go check that out. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our excellent host, the admin, the teacher, and the wizard, Mr. Alan Jude. Hey there, Alan. I'm not a wizard. <laughs> are, you, are you from Canada? Yes. Well, thank you. That proves my point right there. I believe all of you guys are from Canada who have Canadians gray hair. Canadians are not wizards. No, just the anyway. ones with gray hair. Just the ones with gray hair. And you got a little gray right there, Alan. A little bit, just yeah. I mean, you're like early wizard years. Trust me, I, I can tell. Right. I have a way with these things. No, okay, maybe not. No, but you are a teacher, and I appreciate that because I need some explaining this week. We have a big show, a really big show, huge show. In fact, I was telling Alan before the show, it's like, man, we could have cheated. We probably could have broken this off into two separate shows because we've got a ton of email. We've got some really big stories, and then the roundup is also crazy. So I hope you will stick with with us for all of it. And Alan, our first story this week is a little follow-up on the Target Breach story. I guess it's been getting some serious um, review, hasn't it? Uh, yeah, there was a report that was prepared for the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation uh, that kind of explains what happened uh, based on everything we know now. Uh, some of it might not be complete until Target finishes its, its own forensic investigation, uh, but this is basically a compilation of the best of everything we know now, uh, compiled to the lens of what's called kill chain analysis, which basically involves looking at all the things that could have been done to stop the attack, all the different steps uh, where and why we didn't stop them at that step and why we didn't stop them at that step and so on, and uh, how or why each of those wasn't done. Hmm. And then, uh, So kill chain analysis was actually developed by security researchers at Lockheed Martin in 2011, uh, because they were always under attack and they were like, well, we, need, we can't just assume that we'll be able to stop every attack at the door. So we need to look at every step that an attack goes through and look at how we can best stop the attack at each of those different phases. Uh, so this analysis suggests that Target missed a number of opportunities along the kill chain to stop the attackers and prevent the massive data breach. Uh, so I guess maybe it makes most sense to start with a timeline okay. at the very end of the PDF file. Mm-hmm. This is the timeline of the target data breach. And we see that starting back in the beginning of September 2013, we know that target uh, was certified as being PCI DSS compliant, which is the payment card industry data security standard, which basically means that they follow all the rules and that they shouldn't, it shouldn't be easy for an attacker to steal all the credit cards. Mm -hmm. Now, we've talked about it many times, how that uh, compliance there is, is really not stringent enough. But anyway... Uh, at that time, attackers managed to steal credentials from Fazio, which is the uh, HVAC company. Uh, so then around November 12th, the attackers first breached the target network by jumping in through the, um, the company that was monitoring the air conditioning system. Mm -hmm. Between the uh, November 15th and 28th, the attackers test their different uh, malware on the point of sales machines at target stores. Just a small number to start. Uh, then on November 30th, uh, they install their malware on every point of sales terminal at Target. Uh, and they also started installing their data exfiltration malware, which was how they were going to manage to get the data they stole out of the Target network. Uh, at that same time, the semantic uh, security software identified malicious activity related to the exfiltration software, and FireEye, uh, which is... Uh, so a company that makes a anti, it's not really antivirus, but a intrusion detection software. Mm -hmm. uh, alerts there started getting triggered about the point of sales malware when it was installed. Uh, then the attackers installed upgraded versions of the exfiltration malware uh, before they started actually um, taking the data out of the network. That was December second, 
and FireEye triggered more alerts then. But Target didn't do anything about the alerts. Mm. It seems, uh, as we talked about maybe, it seemed like the alerts were buried and there were so many alerts that they just ignored them instead yeah. of actually... Got lost in the them. noise. Yeah. Uh, and then on December 12th, the Department of Justice notified Target about the breach. And on the 15th, Target confirmed the breach and removes most of the malware. And the attackers lose their foothold in the network. On December 18th, uh, Brian Krebs breaks the story about the Target breach. And on the 19th, they publicly announced that 40 million credit cards and debit cards uh, were stolen. And then on January 10th, they upgrade that number uh, to include 70 million people whose personal data was stolen separate from the credit cards. Wow. Jeez. Uh, so the report identifies a bunch of places where Target could have stopped the attack but didn't. Uh, first, Target gave network access to a third-party vendor, a small Pennsylvania heating, ventilation, and air conditioning company, uh, which did not appear to follow broadly accepted information security practices. So the, uh, the IT security at the HVAC company was lax, which you, is not too surprising. Not excusable, but not surprising right. considering they're an HVAC company. Right. Uh, the vendor's weak security allowed the attacker to gain a foothold in Target's network. Uh, but then Target appears to have failed to respond to multiple automated warnings from the company's anti-intrusion software, that'd be the FireEye stuff and the Symantec stuff, uh, that the attackers were installing malware on, the, on Target's uh, point-of-sale systems and in the servers they used for the exfiltration. What's the point of paying for all this FireEye and Symantec software to detect intrusions if you just ignore them when they get reported to you? Boy, I hope a lot of uh, corporations are listening to that statement because I think that happens a lot, Alan. Yeah, well, they think, oh, we have FireEye, so we're protected. Mm. But And then they don't properly resource or staff the people who need to be able to monitor it or give them enough time or have enough of, this, of a discussion yeah. around what they want to see from it. It fails at all it's, kinds of levels. It, one of the interesting things is that it actually did detect it. So <laughs> It know, was working. <laughs> yeah, uh, that kind of gives me a little more confidence than I would have had in the past about anti-intrusion software. Yeah. Yep. Uh, the attackers who infiltrated Target's network uh, with the vendor credentials appear to have successfully moved from less secure areas of Target's network, the HVAC system, to areas storing customer data suggesting that Target failed to properly isolate its most sensitive network assets. So th the fact that they were able to go from the HVAC system to the point of sales terminals is one strike against Target. But the fact that they're also able to get to the databases where all the customer data is was another strike against them. Right. And uh, we also found out from earlier reports that uh, the attackers had access to all of Target's email as well. Mm, man. So they could partially probably watch uh, the IT department talking about them yeah, and if make they it were. easier to evade. Yeah. yeah. And it's entirely possible if they had that level of access, they might have been able to delete the alerts, uh, the email alerts from FireEye saying, hey, administrator, there's an intrusion. <laughs> I suppose they could Although, have. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, FireEye uses a console, it doesn't email you, but you know, that's you know, it, it shows that why that kind of stuff needs to be separated. Mm -hmm. Email is is needs to be very secure, and it's something that a lot of places don't really think about. It's like, oh, if you're in our internal network, you can just go willy nilly on the email. <laughs> yeah. And then it also says Target appears to have failed uh, to respond to multiple warnings from the company's anti intrusion software regarding the escape route the attackers plan to use to exfiltrate data from Target's network. Now. Uh, also, the other one we heard about was, according to the report by Brian Krebs, the customized version of Black POS, the malware that was used to target the point-of-sale systems, mm -hmm. that's available on various cybercrime forums for $1,800 to $2,300. And that's what was installed on Target's uh, point-of-sales machines. Uh, that malware was described by McAfee's Director of Threat Intelligence Operations as absolutely unsophisticated and uninteresting. While at the same time, the Department of Homeland Security said it was very sophisticated. Right. In that it stole data from a point of sales well, terminal. To some people that would be considered sophisticated, but apparently looking at the actual exploit, yeah. it was the code, it was not a very well written code. I, that's what I think it is. I think it kind of depends on your point of view. If you look at something like it's just the capability of doing it, even be able to do this, well, that right there on its face could be considered extremely sophisticated. How you do it, I suppose they don't care so much about the details. And I think. Right. I, but I think if you're McAfee and you look at stuff like this every day, you're like, no, that one's a joke. Right. <laughs> Exactly. There's a reason it only costs two thousand dollars. Yeah. Um, it sounds like there was. Uh, I mean, this is right here on the record now, definite proof that there was negligence on the part of Target. Um, I mean, yeah. well, we've discussed uh, that, 
before, we, we but... Did, yeah, because, uh, you know, the CIO and some of the people from the security staff said, yeah, we tried to do stuff about it, but they told us that, no, you can't have the money to do it. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, the CIO or whatever stepped down, but... Yeah. So there's another one quote in here. Uh, Target's FireEye malware intrusion detection system triggered urgent alerts with each installation of the data exfiltration malware. However, Target's security team neither reacted to the alarm nor allowed FireEye software to automatically delete the malware in question. Oh. Target's semantic antivirus software also detected malicious behavior around November 28th, uh, implicating the same server flagged by FireEye, or FireEye software. So just that... The correlation of, of multiple uh, different security software saying, hey, something fishy is going on on the server should have caused someone to go look at that server, and it didn't happen. Yeah. Uh, hmm. So then uh, we talked a little bit about the, the kill chain, so I wanted to just kind of describe the steps in this kill chain. Uh, you have the graphic up for that? It's the uh, third to last page. Third to last? Okay, yep, I can pull it up. It's the one with uh, the definitions of each step. Yeah, yep, that's it. So uh, the first step in the kill chain is recon, right? That's when the attackers are doing research, identifying different systems, selecting who they're going to go after. Uh, for example, these guys probably didn't start out picking target. They were like, where can we break into? And it's like, oh, look, we found right. targets. So this wasn't their them. first at time out, right, is what you're saying? This right. Is, yeah. But also, they didn't pick target and then exploit and then try to find an exploit for target. They went out and said, who can we exploit and happen to find target? Yeah, gotcha. Ah. It's really funny to be talking about targets and then the, sh the store is called Target. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so then you have the weaponized phase, right? That's where you put together uh, remote access malware with an exploit. So that's when you take your, co your exploit or whatever and stick it in a PDF file or an Office file or, mm -hmm. or a Flash or Java exploit and deliver it. So the next step is the delivery. That's how you transmit the weapon to the target, whether that's as an email attachment with like phishing or something or just you know tricking people into opening it. Or if it's on a website, like a watering hole, where you just trick people into going to the website, or it's a website they were going to go to anyway, a legitimate website, mm -hmm. and you just happen to have broken into it and affected it. Or, you know, the old leave a USB stick in the, in the parking lot, right? Yeah, somebody just pick it up, plug it in. Yeah, and then we have the exploit. Once delivered, the weapon code has to be triggered, uh, exploiting the vulnerable application or system. Right. So, yes, you can email someone an attachment, but you have to convince them to open it. Yeah. And once they do, that's when you've exploited the system. And then you have the install phase. That's when the weapon installs a backdoor that allows the attacker persistent access. Right. So now you have a way that you can get into that system whenever you want. And then you have command and control. That's when you're, you're, the infection there, this, the virus, uh, communicates with outside servers uh, and allows the attacker to get inside the network, to give instructions, to update the virus or whatever they have to do. And then finally, you have the action phase. That's when the attacker works to achieve their objective, whether that's exfiltrating data like credit cards or, you know, in more uh, espionage type cases, stealing plans or designs or right. intelligence data of some kind. Or their goal may just be to destroy the data, right? Break in and delete some data. Uh, or some other further, further intrusion, right? To now that I've exploited this system, I want to hop into the next one, mm -hmm. which is kind of as you know, as the attackers broke into the HVAC company, their action was to jump into the target network, and once they broke there, they had to break into the the point of sales network and so on. So they actually went through this whole thing multiple times as well, right? They go through the kill chain in multiple occasions, and then uh, the second to last image page of the PDF actually shows the timeline and the various chances. Uh, that target missed in order to stop the attack. Right? So during the recon, weaponize, and deliver phase, the attackers took advantage of weak security at target's vendor to gain a foothold in target's inner network. Right? So if the HVAC company had had better security, they mm -hmm. wouldn't have got to the recon phase. During the delivery and exploit phase, target missed warnings from its anti-intrusion software that the attackers were installing malware on their network. Right? They had basically a month's notice that something hinky was going on and they just ignored it. Then, through the delivery, exploit, and install phase, the attacker took advantage of weak controls within Target's own network to successfully maneuver into the more sensitive areas. Right? If the HVAC control system had been isolated so that you couldn't get to the point-of-sale systems from there, then they would have never been able to deliver the exploit to the point-of-sales machines. Right. 
or exploit them or install and so right. And finally, during the command and control and action phase, target missed information provided by anti-intrusion software again about the attacker's escape plan, which allowed the attackers to steal the 110 million customer records. Right? If they had been monitoring the network activity more closely, they would be like, what's this FTP connection to Brazil or Russia? <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't allow that. <laughs> yeah, they might have caught that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if they had managed to shut that down, they maybe could have stopped a lot of the cards from being able to leave the network and the attackers wouldn't have got as many credit cards as they did. So yeah, Target missed a lot of opportunities there uh, to do that. But yeah, uh, so also in the story here, I've linked uh, a video kind of explaining some of the, the kill chain, how, how Lockheed came up with the kill chain. Then there's their paper called the Intelligence Driven Computer Network Defense Informed by Analysis of Adversary Campaigns in Intrusion Kill Chains. Which is an awesome name for an academic paper. No kidding. <laughs> and it basically describes how they came up with the system and how you can use it to uh, protect your network. Very and, good. And, you know, and how there's basically different steps you have to take to protect yourself at each of those different levels of the attack and how you can, uh, you know, even if you miss the chance uh, to stop them from exploiting uh, a vulnerability to get inside your network, yeah. if you can then detect or stop them from installing the malware, then they can't get to the command and control phase and they can't ultimately get to the action phase. Mm. Interesting. And um, um, more damning of target than I expected. Not that I didn't expect them to be, but uh, 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 at, you know, no fault or lack any fault, but uh, to me, it seems well, pretty clear there was several points of critical failure, and the most yeah, obnoxious well, one is the logging that they just were completely ignoring because that's something anybody, no matter what your scale, does have the capability of getting their hands around if they really dedicate the time and resources yep. to it. It's, yeah, I guess it's, it's almost more damning that they had all that, all those chances they missed them. Like if they yeah. just not, if they had just not had FireEye installed, right, and not been triggered, then it'd be slightly know. less offensive. Yeah, even though. Technically, you should be more uh, upset the fact that they didn't have that, but at the same time, yeah, the fact that they had the information and just didn't use it uh, makes it worse. Alan, it's like when you get your wife pregnant and you had the condom in the drawer next to the bed. You know, you had the you had the means to prevent the accident, but it still happened, and now your CTO gets fired. That's what <laughs> you know. That's how it goes, Alan. <laughs> sure. All right. Well, why don't I take a minute here before we get to our next story, which is another big story? And thank Ting dot com. Ting is mobile that makes sense. My mobile service provider, and just something you've got to go check out. It is a way to completely flip the value proposition around on your cellular service. If you're using one of the big carriers right now, then you're locked into a contract where every single month you're paying way more money than you should for something you may or may not be getting the full value out of. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to techsnap.ting.com because that's going to get you right there to the TechSnap landing page where they'll take $25 off your first month or $25 off your first device if you don't already have a Ting compatible device. And they have a great BYOD page. They've got, uh, they recently just uh, added the HTC One that you can bring over to the Ting network, which is one of my all time favorite phones. But here's what's really neat about Ting. No contracts, no termination fee, and you only pay for what you use. They start out at a flat $6 per month, and then it's just your usage on top of that. And they have a really fantastic dashboard that you can take advantage of to properly manage your account. Now, they have great customer service. You can call them at one eight five five ding ftw anytime between 8 a.m., or 8 p.m. Eastern, and a real Canadian answers the phone. They're going to solve your problem for you like on the first or second ring, and they're actually empowered to solve your problem. But I actually never really even need to take advantage of that because their dashboard is so well done. I can go in there. I can label my phones. It's easy to navigate, easy to get an idea of what my usage is at. I've got my phone in there. I've got Rikai's phone in there. We can see individual data usage. We can set individual alerts. You can go set up call forwarding or what, you, what, what do you want to happen when you don't answer after a certain amount of rings. All those kinds of options are right there. Maybe you want to turn the device off for a little while. It's all available right in there. It's such a great way to manage your account. It's really setting the benchmark for the entire mobile industry. And that's combined with their no-hold customer service, which also sets the benchmark for the entire industry. And here's what's really fun about Ting is I think they've kind of figured out that a lot of you guys out there and gals are a little geeky. So they mm -hmm. have got a really awesome challenge going on right now. Over on the Ting blog, you can read more about it. It's all about saving your data. They're calling it the Drop Your Data Challenge. And it's a great way to get Ting credits 
Even if you're not a Tin customer, you can still be entered to win for a drawing. They've got all the details out there. If you bring your data usage down, it's a kind of a fun way to save money on your data, but also challenge yourself to see if you can use compression or VPNs or different ways to manage your mobile data and just get as much as you can. And that's what's so awesome about Ting is they're really all about saving you guys as much money as possible. That's the structure yeah. of their model. That's really what's great about their model. And they're Canadian. Most other phone companies are trying to get you to use more data. And, and you know... Like, seriously, I've been using them now for well well over a year. And a couple of times now, just having the built-in hotspot and tethering, knowing that when I need to go to that, I don't have to worry about getting busted by my, my mobile provider. I don't have to worry about having some sort of special plan where tethering is allowed. And I don't have to worry about going over some sort of magical cap where they've just decided all of these bits, these are the bits you have access to. Bits over this line, this magical made-up line, those are precious bits, and we're going to charge you much, much more for the. I think when, when I yeah. need to tether, I, like, I really need that functionality, and I don't have the stress of worrying about that because things just pay for what you use. So go over to techsnap.ting.com to get started. What were like we say? mentioned, it, it, saved, it saved two episodes of TechSnap the other week. Yeah, it did. It really did. And I knew that we'd be safe to just turn it on and good to go. And both Alan and my laptop, we jumped on the hotspot and we were rocking it until the Comcast yeah. connection came back, which took like all freaking day. Yeah. yeah. We were actually halfway through the first episode before it finally came back. Ting saved the day. Helped us get all of our yeah. research done and start that first episode. So go to techsnap.ting.com. That lets them know you heard about it right here on the TechSnap program. And you can try out that savings calculator and see how much you would save by switching to Ting. I think you're going to be pretty impressed. TechSnap.ting.com. And a really big thank you to Ting for sponsoring the TechSnap program. Okay, Alan. So, you know, I, I thought OAuth was like uh, safe. I thought we were good. Now, I'm reading this headline here that there's critical holes in not just OAuth, but OpenID that could leak information. Should I panic? Yep. Should I should I just be freaking out, pulling my hair out? Because I really like uh, my hair. There's not much you can do about it, and it'll get fixed, and uh, that's about it. So my hair is safe, is what you're saying. Save the hair. Okay, I so suppose. tell me what's going on. Uh, so there's a vulnerability in the way OAuth and OpenID work, even though they're not the same code base at all, but yeah. just in the way they work. Okay. Uh, that's been found that could be used to trick a user into being redirected to a malicious site or disclosing information they didn't want to. Uh, so OAuth and OpenID are commonly used to allow a user to log in or authenticate uh, on a site using credentials from another site. Right? So with OAuth, um, you get uh, the server issues you a token and you can pass that token to an application or another site to allow them to have access to your account or whatever. Right? So you can you know, authorize a third-party Twitter app to access your Twitter account so you can use Twitter on your phone or use multiple Twitter accounts through a website or whatever. Right? Or OpenID is all about uh, having one login that you use on lots of different places and having that be all federated together. Uh, and you know you can use that on a lot of sites. will allow you to log in uh, using a Facebook, Google, or Microsoft ID rather than having to register on each website separately. Uh, and especially useful when some of those places provide you two-factor authentication because then you're getting two-factor on a lot of different websites instead of just your own, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so the flaw could allow an attacker to steal personal data from users and redirect them to questionable sites. Uh, what makes this especially dangerous is that it would happen on a trusted site. Uh, so say you're a user and you're logged into Facebook and you're doing whatever and you could be tricked into loading content from an unsafe site uh, and in doing so may leak private data from your uh, Facebook to that unsafe site. Mm. But as far as it looks like on your screen, you haven't left Facebook. Oh, so that's kind of tricky. Yeah. So it says, for OAuth 2, the attack uh, could primarily, primarily jeopardize the tokens of site users. If a user were to authorize the login, the attackers could then use that to access the user's personal data, right? So if you click the accept button or whatever, then the attacker now have access to your Facebook and get any information that you have in there or mm -hmm. even perform actions as you. Or look, uh, yeah. Or, or yeah, yeah, I mean, even if that's just looking at your pictures. Yeah. yeah, and uh, when it comes to uh, OpenID, the attacker could get users' information directly as it's immediately transferred to the provider upon request, right? Because the whole idea with OpenID is when you use it to log into another site, it sends that site your, your name and email address and stuff so that it creates your profile on that site, right? It saves you from registering on that site again by sending that data. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're not on purpose, but sending that data to a malicious site, that's not what you wanted, right? Uh, 
the attacker could exploit the affected protocols via a pop-up message through Facebook, for example, and trick the user into giving their information to an otherwise legitimately, uh, legitimate site. Right? So when the, po- the request pops up on Facebook, you're, it's like Facebook is asking for this information and you, say, you agree to give that to Facebook, yeah. not knowing that it was actually not Facebook that was asking for it, it's being sent somewhere else. Hmm. How would I even know? Yeah, it's uh, pretty tricky. So uh, the researcher has a blog and a, a site, kind of like the Heartbleed one, where he's put all the details in a and a about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, and he also has uh, videos showing the exploit being used against a bunch of different sites. So he actually has like uh, videos uh, showing that attack being used against, uh, there's a bunch of sites here, uh, Amazon, the New York Times, eBay, WordPress, and UQ. I don't know what that is. Some of these are like Russian. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, and it talks about the OAuth 2 and OpenID covert redirect, where you're being redirected to another site without knowing it. Wow. Huh. List of affected major providers on here is uh, PayPal as well, LinkedIn. Yeah, although PayPal sent out a message saying that because of the way they use their thing, uh, PayPal's not really vulnerable to this. Oh. Because you don't authorize uh, other people to use your PayPal account usually, right? <laughs> Uh, oh, right. I suppose not. I suppose that would be the saving kind of thing, huh? Yeah, uh, but a lot of the other apps are vulnerable. Uh, so it says the websites that are vulnerable need to carry out sufficient verification of the URLs used in redirects so that they don't fall for this attack. Huh. So uh, I guess we just wait for updates then. Yeah, uh, in general, it's it's up to the websites that are affected to fix their uh, implementations rather than it's not something the user can do per se. Right, okay. Very good, Mr. Jude. Well, any other thoughts on that one? But uh, There's lots of detail in here uh, on the researcher's blog and uh, the different parts of his website that explain it all. That's uh, uh, One of the other sites that's vulnerable is GitHub. Oh. That was one I wanted to mention. It's interesting that he did sort of a Heartbleed-like uh, a website for it. Yeah. Hey, it's the new... Uh, it's the, it's the new way to get the word it. out. <clears throat> it's a new yeah. way on. It's a brave new yeah, world for exploits where you get publicity and it boosts your career and gets you recognition and maybe even gets you a little bit of a blog following. Mm-hmm. Woo! I'm so excited. All right. Well, let me tell you something I actually am genuinely excited about. That's our next sponsor. That's DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is simple cloud hosting built for developers, but it's built for everyone, too. you got to go check it out. Go over to DigitalOcean.com. We've got a great promo code for you. They'll get you a $10 credit. Brand new promo code. Brand new, Snap May. How do you like that? We got a new promo code for the month of May. So what is DigitalOcean? Like I mentioned, it's simple cloud hosting dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way to spin up a cloud server. Users can get started in about 55 seconds, although I suspect our audience is somewhere in the 40 to 50 second range because you guys are pretty elite. Uh, And here's what you get for $5 a month. 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer, which is so awesome that you get that for a fixed $5. Plus, when you use our code SNAPMAY, the new code SNAPMAY, you get that $10 credit. You can try that $5 rig out for two months absolutely free. That's an incredible deal. And DigitalOcean has data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, and Amsterdam. Their interface is simple. They have a very intuitive control panel, and users can replicate it on a larger scale if they like with their very straightforward API. We're seeing a lot of great community apps come around that, and DigitalOcean has some really awesome features that I know our audience in particular is going to want to take advantage of. Uh, And I've heard that, you know, I've been hearing a great range of ideas from the audience. Our Google Plus community has uh, a few uh, threads going on what folks are doing. I've also gotten some emails from folks that run their Minecraft server up there. Somebody else runs his BitTorrent sync server up there like I do. Of course, there's uh, lots of developers in our audience that use it to run the back end for their websites, for their apps, for whatever it might be. It'd be a great one for uh, KeyPass, which is something kind of like LastPass, except for you put the database on your own server. Absolutely. Uh, and for $5 a month, it's not much to, to, you know, just have a safe place to put something like your keys and stuff. Yeah. And you probably find many other uses for it too, but, uh, you know, yeah, even, absolutely. Just, even if you had the, server, the $5 a month server just to manage your passwords, it's worth it. Yep. And they will run uh, Ubuntu, CentOS, Debian, Fedora. There's some rumors about some other operating systems Alan might be familiar with. And of course, they've got one click application deployments, and the reliability is top notch. I haven't had a single outage yet myself, but they also have a 99.99% SLA. And on top of all of that, when you do have issues, I have had a lot of win stories. That's what I'm calling them, Alan win stories. Mm-hmm. Because they're not just success stories. 
DigitalOcean totally hooks them up when they've had an issue. The technical support has been fast, extremely responsive, and usually goes over and beyond the call of duty to make sure that whatever the issue is, is resolved. So go over to DigitalOcean.com and use that brand new promo code just for the month of May, Snap May. And uh, get yourself that $10 credit. If nothing else, go check it out just to see how amazing their interface is for what is used to be a fairly complicated task of provisioning a virtual server and deploying it and then managing it. And it's just it's amazing what you can do. DigitalOcean.com, Snap May, and a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the TechSnap program. <clears throat> All right, Alan. Where do we go next? What, where, does the, where does the TechSnap train take us? Our next story is Mozilla recommends a new approach to net neutrality to the FCC. Look at them. Boop, boop. Yes. So what's, right, what are they up to? Uh, we actually have proposals from a number of different companies in this, in this particular story. But, uh, so yeah, Mozilla has filed a petition with the FCC suggesting a new approach uh, to the way they handle net neutrality. And specifically, uh, what Amazon's recommending. Uh, Mozilla petition, or Amazon? Which, sorry, uh, yes, yeah, sorry, Mozilla. My bad. Uh, in the PDF that you can see, the PDF they actually sent to the FCC. Uh, but basically, uh, they have a graphic on the blog post, and it shows that a new approach involves looking at the entire question from the opposite direction. Right? Rather than looking at the fact that Comcast is providing Netflix, Amazon, and YouTube to its customers, uh, or to a specific customer, Comcast is instead providing its customers access to remote services. Right, so the way Comcast wants to look at it is that Netflix should be paying them for access to Comcast customers. In reality, the way it's supposed to be is Comcast is providing its customers, right, like you and Alice and Carol and David, in the example, access to remote services right. like Netflix or Dropbox or Amazon or right. YouTube. Yes. Uh, right. Comcast has flipped new, this around, haven't? They're that, trying to. Well, they have. Mozilla is yeah. absolutely right. The way they frame this entire conversation. Mm -hmm is completely backwards. Yeah. Uh, but if, if you flip it around the way it's supposed to be, using that new understanding of the shape of the internet, uh, <laughs> Mozilla believes that that gives the FCC, uh, or the FCC already has authority to impose strong net neutrality rules in that case, oh. which would resolve the question of whether, they, whether or not they have the authority, uh, you know, which was brought up when their last ruling was struck down. So... You know, the uh, Mozilla is just saying that if you look at it the right way around, you already have the authority to do what you need to do. Right. If you look at it the actual correct technical way. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so Mozilla, at the bottom of their blog post, has actually posted a couple of clarifications since this story first came out because based on comments and such, they noticed people were not quite understanding it. Yeah. Uh, specifically, it says their petition asked the FCC to use Title II uh, but it isn't a reclassification uh, because it wouldn't uh, reverse existing precedents. So they're not asking to change anything. You're just like, if you look at it this way, right. you already have all the power you need. You guys love the word games anyways. Just play our word game. Uh, and they said that Mozilla specifically is not asking the FCC to apply Title II to peering and interconnects, only the last mile uh, remote delivery services. Uh, so this, they're not asking the FCC to change anything about the way Comcast can peer with people, only that they have to, you know, provide access on an equal basis to, for any service to deliver stuff to Comcast customers. Uh, and it says their petition would not impose obligations on technology companies, but instead would safeguard them from delivering uh, uh, by clearly delineating the services that they provide. Uh, huh. So now, uh, level three, which is one of the main backbones on the internet. Uh, they have a couple of blog posts, one from uh, March called ISPs Play Chicken with the Future of the Internet, and they've been filing a number of briefs with the FCC about that, uh, and then they have their other one, Observations from an Internet Middleman. Love this uh, one. Have, yeah, they have some graphs and they show, and specifically what they state in their article there is there are six peers uh, with level three that have congestion on almost every single one of their inter interconnect ports between the peer and level three. Six. Uh, yeah. Congestion that is permanent and has been in place for well over a year hmm. and where the peer refuses to augment capacity. So, you know, they have like a 10 gigabit or 100 gigabit port between the two places and it's maxed out during most of the day or all the time. And level three is like, yeah, we'll, we'll give you more ports. You just need to have ports on your side and we'll create the cross connect and we'll split the price. And the provider's like, no. 
we're not going to do that. Uh, so they're deliberately harming the service they deliver to their paying customers. They're not allowing us to fulfill the requests their customers make for content. Right? Comcast is like, we, we, you mean we, we have to, like, um, level three isn't asking Comcast to pay for anything. They're just saying you need to add more ports to your router. Keep your infrastructure up to date. Yeah. Keep it up to capacity. Yeah. This is like, you know, the pipe's only this big around and you're trying to put more traffic down it than can fit and that's causing packet loss. Like they actually have graphs showing the utilization and you can see during parts of the day there's like constant packet loss happening because they're trying to shove too much data across that pipe. Uh, now the important point, uh, so um, Level 3's original point was that there are 12 places where they have congestion. Six of those places, it was only in one city and it, they're currently working on upgrading it. Okay. Right. So just suddenly there was congestion, and like they talked to the other place, and like yeah, so we'll add more ports, and we'll add, connect them up, and then there won't be any congestion anymore. But six of those are have been congested for over a year, and the other side refuses to add some ports to the router to facilitate the cross connect. These guys are to me. This seems like obvious strong arming. Yeah. Well, and specifically when you look at you know the six people that are upgrading are all internet providers and whatever, and the six people that aren't. <clears throat> Uh, all six are large broadband customer networks uh, with a dominant or exclusive market share in their local market. Mm -hmm. In countries or markets where customers have multiple broadband choices, there is absolutely no congested peers. Weird. And it's uh, exclusive could be another way to say mon monopoly of the market. Yes. Um, yeah. So, so if, if they don't have Comcast to had to compete with someone, they would upgrade those ports. Right. Because other, they're degrading the experience of their customers, right. but because of the customer's only yep. choice, yep. they're like, "Well, why would we? Uh, why should we well, add an extra and, port?" To and our why router? not? Why not hang tight and be like, "Well, if you want us to improve this, you should pay us. Pay up. If you want yeah. access to our customers, pay up. We are exclusive. Your words. We're exclusive in this market. If you want access, more a faster access to our exclusive customers." Pay us. Where you're right, if they had to compete with somebody else who could provide the same access, just for competitive sake, they would upgrade that. That way, they wouldn't look bad when compared to their competitor. Yeah. So then we have another link here. Uh, one was a summary of the the post from Level Three. It's Level Three claims six big ISPs are purposely degrading traffic. Uh, but the next one is Level Three and Cogent asked the FCC for protection from ISP tolls, like um, Comcast and Verizon are trying to do. Mm-hmm. And the quote here is, while ISPs say that traffic loads are too heavy from Netflix and so on, Level 3, Cogent, and Netflix argue that ISPs are abusing their market power. Since customers often have little to no choice in internet providers, that means there's only one path from Netflix traffic to reach the customers. And, uh, you know, there's only one last mile. And so Netflix doesn't really have a choice of how to deliver video to Comcast customers. It has to go through Comcast. Right. And Comcast is abusing their their monopoly there. Man, I'm so glad Level 3 is stepping up and, and taking this on because they're, they are kind of the ideal. Um, well, they're like, they were the first and second biggest. Now they're like the first and third or something. Right. And they've got they, like. They, they bought the second biggest and then kind of switched some of the customers over to the first brand. And they, have, they run them as two separate brands. Still. They've got this cross selection of different uh, providers that they interface with. So they have yeah. all of this data where they can throw around and be like, look, these are just numbers. This is just the data traffic and the way it's flowing. It comes right down to these guys every single like, time. We, we have connections with the 51 biggest places on the internet and or the biggest providers and networks on the internet. And there are six of them that are purposely making it bad. Mm -hmm. And all six of them are ISPs, and all six of them are the ISPs that don't have competition. Yeah. All the ISPs that have competition are upgrading their networks. And it's multifaceted, too, because some of these ISPs also have reasons to maybe not want Netflix or YouTube to perform that well. You know, it would exactly. kind of be in their best interest if you didn't watch to, like, that. own Hulu. <laughs> right, or have on-demand the services they want you to pay for, or et cetera, exactly. et cetera. Uh, yeah. So uh, there's so, a lot like of it going on there. Yeah. And like I said, uh, Level 3 and Cogent both filed uh, comments with the FCC, which have the links to PDFs there. In Level 3, they said, uh, the commission should require last mile ISPs to interconnect on commercially reasonable terms without the payment of an access charge. So mm -hmm. is you know when it makes sense, uh, Comcast should be forced to not allow congestion to stay for a year like that. Um, 
But, you know, level three was very specific about, you know, we're not asking you to force anybody to do anything. We're not saying that ISP should have to peer with anyone who wants to, even if they only have like one megabit of traffic or something, because mm-hmm. that costs too much. Mm-hmm. And it's like level three is saying, we'll even accept Comcast saying, we don't want to peer there. We want you to draw, to run a line over to this data center and we'll peer with you there. And level three is like, fine, we'll do that. But you can't just say no. And when it makes when it's commercially reasonable, you have you have to give us terms that are actually possible to meet. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, Cogent proposed much harsher terms. Uh, they would like the FCC to reclassify ISPs so they're subject to the common carrier rules, mm-hmm. and requested that quote when interconnection points become congested, the FCC should have the authority to intervene. Uh, this would force the broadband providers to show cause why it should not be required to implement prompt remedial measures to relieve the sustained state of congestion. So what they're saying is that, you know, if an ISP is refusing to upgrade, then Cogent should be allowed to complain to the FCC, and the FCC be like, you have to explain why you're not upgrading that, or upgrade it now. I, I like the idea of that. I don't know about it in practice, but I think I like the idea. Yeah. Uh, and Gives us some sort of stick. I, I'm kind of... Think it's almost like the level three and the cogent are good cop, bad cop. The level three one is much more uh, palatable to the to the last mile ISPs. Yeah, and the cogent is is a little more stronger. And I'm hoping that that will cause something in the ISPs middle. To, yeah, well, or no, just even just accept level three to avoid having uh. <laughs> being pushed into uh, the cogent. It would area. still be an improvement. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Because uh, what cogent has, uh, came out today and said is that they believe that Comcast should have to pay. Uh, to augment the connections with Cogent, not the other way around. Uh, let's do it. It's about time. Because, because Cogent and Level 3 are Tier 1s. The, by definition, they do not pay people, right? Except for, for access to part of networks they don't have or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Comcast is an access network. They're supposed to have to pay for transit. Currently, uh, Comcast only buys transit from like one place and then does everything else by just using their bulk to force people to peer with them. Even if it's not ideal. Yeah. yeah. So back in 2010, uh, InterNAP, which is a big backbone uh, provider, uh, their network architecture manager said Comcast runs its ports with Tata, which is the, uh, uh, the backbone that Comcast does buys its transit from, deliberately as a means, uh, or sorry, they run the ports at capacity, so they max them out, uh, deliberately as a means of degrading connections to networks which don't directly peer with them <sighs> or pay them money. See, that's what I was suspecting. Yeah, and that's, that was back in 2010 where basically Comcast would refuse to buy more transit to the internet saying you should peer with us and pay or pay us rather than than us. I mean, as why an not? provider having to buy more it's transit. It's just it's the like, customers who are paying you who suffer, right? I mean, so well, what's yeah, the big deal? Comcast's job as an ISP is to provide that data to the customers. The customers are requesting the data, right? Netflix isn't sending the data to Comcast because they want to. <laughs> they're saying it because their Comcast we, customers we are asked asking for it. for it. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. And and yeah. And that's why I'm paying the Comcast is so I have access to it. The, yeah, exactly. Uh, the customer pays Comcast for access to the entire internet. Yes. And Comcast should have to provide that. The only and thing that if, should ever if it's slow using too much bandwidth, then Comcast shouldn't have sold oversold their network so much. Well, yeah, like I'm selling mean, people like 100 and 300 megabit connections when they can't possibly provide even a fraction of that. There's that. And and the only time as if I'm paying, especially for how much I pay for internet here, it is ridiculous because it's the business. I, 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 the only time it should ever be slow is when the remote connection can't keep up with the speeds that I'm using. And it, it should never be the provider that I'm paying money for. That's why I pay so much money for. Like The, the yeah. fact that they are under-investing in their infrastructure is the most upsetting part to me. Yeah, and uh, the Ars Technica story there goes to show that uh, Comcast is making record profits uh, and that Go figure. Um, specifically they're seeing this charging access fees to Netflix and stuff as a new revenue model basically getting paid for nothing oh. like yes we love getting paid for nothing let's do more of that man that gets my blood pressure up Alan I gotta say yeah. I gotta say yeah. it's dirty and, and this whole idea of the fast lane for the internet is horrible and needs to be shot down mesh networking no. 
Could you imagine the, the amount of security topics we'd have if the whole internet was just a bunch of people with mesh, with a mesh network router in their house? <laughs> that man, that keep we'd have to we go to two, three shows anything. a week, <laughs> and only a few people could download it. Well, hopefully, uh, with the pressure, and we we have more stories in the roundup too uh, about this. So if you're interested in this topic, stay tuned because there's some good news too in the roundup. Um, but all right, let's take a moment here and talk about some other good news. That's IX Systems. Go to ixsystems.com slash techsnap to get started. Let them know you heard about it right here on the show. Also gets you the info you need to find out more about IX Systems. These guys build systems that are the perfect machines to run open source, powered by Intel processors, backed by not only white glove support and an amazing burning QA process that you can count on, but also just an incredible group of experts behind the product. And we've talked a lot about... So a a three-year warranty with an optional upgrade to a five-year warranty. Which is awesome, too. Yep. Uh, we've talked about like how awesome some of their high-end solutions are. They're yep. really, really crazy. But I've had the opportunity recently back here at JB1 to just sort of re-familiarize myself with the free NAS Mini. And I have the but older you, you model. Have the old one. Yeah. yeah. And I, That's even awesome. still, no, I mean, even still, I really appreciate this rig. It is a compact tank. It's got USB 3, eSATA. It's got the four hot swap drives. Plus, what IX Systems did is they put the FreeNAS installation on a USB header, a motherboard header attached storage device. So I have 16 gigabytes of dedicated storage just for the FreeNAS operating systems, which means all of nice. the four hot swappable drives are all dedicated to ZFS. I don't have to like carve off a couple hundred megabytes on one of them for FreeNAS. And when that's the drive that dies, I lose FreeNAS. No, they got it on yeah. a separate USB device. And it... I, I gotta tell you, well, Alan. Like years later, FreeNAS is because of the ZFS and stuff. If you lose, if the FreeNAS USB stick right, dies, you right. just replace it with another one and re-import your pool. You could, if you just needed to get back up and running. We were, we were actually playing with this. If you just like say, like the little USB dongle, like just got toasted, or uh, you know, the something happened to the OS installation, you could just boot off of a USB thumb drive. We tried this, and it will see the storage, and you can get back up and running in just like a few minutes. It's it's yep. amazing. It, it to me was like, this really is a good example of how IX. It doesn't matter if it's if it's something like for your small business, your home, all the way up to these monster, massive solutions that are just completely and truly innovative. They've really thought through all of it, like like all yeah. of it. They really give well, a lot of attention and detail uh, to their work. I have at my house a little short depth one. It's only like uh, uh, 12 inches deep or yeah. something. It's rack mountable still. Uh, and it's got like four gigabit Ethernet cards and everything I need. And it didn't cost very much at all. It was uh, under $1,000. Yeah. And it's got the all that. And a, uh, the newest like Intel uh, E3 processor, the Haswell or whatever, the mm -hmm. very, very newest one, mm -hmm. uh, which wasn't even out at the time when I bought this. <laughs> nice. Like they, 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 they had to wait for the processor to be directly shipped from Asia to put it in my machine and ship it to me. I, I also like on their website, they just recently posted a uh, getting started with your first FreeNAS setup uh, guide. Well, that, that was actually uh, a talk at Linux Fest Northwest. Yep. yep. Uh, and it was they put they they that, included the they video the too video. Yep. They, it's from the talk so they got a video of it so if you want to watch one of the talks at Linux yeah. Fest Northwest about setting up free NAS they got it right up there on their website get started by going to ixsystems.com slash techsnap and then see what they have to offer there's a yeah. lot we've talked Basically, about any anything from a tiny little router or little free NAS storage box up to the types of machines you need a forklift to move. <laughs> like uh, on their on their Facebook they have this awesome one of like two pallet loads and it's like a giant system, a, a true NAS with like two heads and a bunch of storage sleds and enough hard drives. It's like 400 terabytes, and it's just two pallets that have to be moved. With really? A oh, I'm looking. Yeah. I'm looking for it right now. It's it's back a little ways, but <clears throat> that's cool. There's a picture of you on their Facebook page. I see that. Yeah. There's Mr. Yeah, Jude hanging out. Um, yeah, I, I, but you, you just see like a bunch of boxes and like shrink wrap. And the other great thing is because of the, the just the amazing crew they have working for them, they also have relationships with some of the most important hardware vendors in the business, like great yes. relationships. And that way, you know that when they're working on a solution, they have the broadest understanding possible. And, and even people who are experts in their field can go to IX Systems and talk to them about the solution that they're looking to create and have peace of mind to know that the recommendation they've received from IX is 
exactly the best recommendation and is very well informed. It's a decision you can count on. It's something you can go to management, something you can go to your boss with a proposal and have the confidence that it's going to work out for you. So go to ixsystems.com slash techsnap. See what we've been talking about. If you've been thinking about getting yourself a storage machine, I'm going to just double down on my recommendation for the free NAS Mini after just getting a chance to play with it all over again. I'm just I'm impressed all over again. It's seriously good stuff. ixsystems.com slash techsnap. Thanks, guys. Okay, Mr. Jude. Well, that's the news. I feel like that's like news part one because we have like news part two in the roundup. But first, we have a rockin' feedback segment, huge feedback segment. So, Alan, stand by. Brace yourselves. It's time for the TechSnap Feedback. Thanks for sending your emails to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or popping that contact link at the top of the Jupiter Broadcasting website, or even better, starting a thread in our subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. And we did get one of those this week, Mr. Jude, but first we're going to start with an email from Voldly. Voldly going into our inbox. He wants an essential software list, and I had a couple ideas, but here we go. He says, hey guys, I recently got a DigitalOcean VPS, and I love it. I run a few IRC bots on it and a web server and a few Twitter bots. I recently came to know about fail to ban and installed it immediately. Are there more such softwares that must be installed on a VPS like this? I'm a student and a programmer and don't know much about server administrations, although I find Linux on the desktop to be easy as pie. Thanks for the great show. Looking forward to our recommendations. What do you think, Alice? Who's got failed to ban on there? Yeah, or deny host one of the two. Uh, what else do I install? What about often? is Tripwire over the top? You think? Um, I don't use it, but yeah, they, that wouldn't be a bad one to have. Yeah. Uh, again, only useful if you actually read the reports and you know right? keep the database up to date and stuff. So isn't that the most important part? Is yep. like I would say, <laughs> like it's almost not even about software you install. It's lock down the accounts. Configure SSH properly, set up fail to ban or, or uh, the yep. other one, and then check your dang logs. Yep. Check your dang uh, logs. Well, there's, uh, what is it, like Log Watch or something? There's yep. one for helping you watch the logs yes. so you don't in have fact, to read every line. In fact, do Log up. Watch. Do Log Watch very much because yep. that, that that's how I do it. I'm not Mr. like, well, let me SSH into my box and uh, pull up the journal. No. Log Watch is, what, is what's up. And what's great for me is I've got a, I've got a home server that's just dying. It's network ports going out. It's got errors up the wazoo. And I've been getting a sense of that because I get the important stuff shoots out an email to me. And I love LogWatch. So there you go. All right, Voldly. Go Voldly install that stuff. Uh, I don't know. It depends what you like. Uh, on my systems, I always have to install Nano, but that's usually there by default on most Linuxes, but not for me. Um, I use Nload. Just the letter N, load. It's yeah. a little terminal utility for monitoring the load on the network card. That's good. Mm -hmm. It's more of a thing for watching stuff. On Linux, uh, I usually have to install some alternative to top because the top in Linux is junk Okay, compared to the top in BSD. DStat's a uh, good one. Like HTOP or something. HTOP's a great one. Yep. Uh, I don't know any of them. Speedometer or speed meter. I just did a great last pick that's an N curses bandwidth graphing tool. That's fun. You know, just get an idea of what your VPS is. All right. Well, there you go. There's a good look. Uh, a good list. Um, I use rsync a lot, but that's more of my use case than something I would say every server needs to have. Yeah. You know what you should put on there is a Quasal, put a Quasal server on there too. I think he said he already has his MyRC stuff. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right, Alan. Our next email comes from Demetrius. He says, uh, now this is so frustrating. It's a little long, but yep. I, I don't know if maybe, maybe we can give him some advice. He says, hello, I love your show, and I want to ask you a simple question. We're a small hosting company. I've been under constant attacks. How do you deal with an ISP who will not report or who will not respond to your rebuse reports? For the past year, and to be completely honest, it's been more than a year, a certain IP that belongs to Primatel PLC in Cyprus has been trying to connect to a system under our control using HTTP requests. The funny thing is that system doesn't even host a web server, and the IP in question is constantly being banned by our IDS system. We've contacted Primatel over a year ago, providing logs, showing the connection attempts. They just pretty much ignored us. We contacted our upstream ISP, CYTA, and they were talking on the while well, talking on their phone with their third level tier support. He didn't even know how to add an IP to their ACL list, and we had to show them how to do it. One year later, the connection st attempts still persist. We've even tried to involve live uh, or law enforcement, the Cypress Police, and the Electronic Crimes Unit. 
They've gotten nowhere. This past couple of weeks, we logged over 8,000, yes, 8,000 connection attempts from that IP. So how do you deal with a completely incompetent wannabe ISP? Is there something I could contact upstream of them, an authority that might be able to stop ignoring me? Thank you, Demetrius. Well, what you're seeing isn't anything serious enough to be able to get someone disconnected or something. So I would just say add a permanent firewall rule and stop worrying about it. But yeah, I mean, um, eight, eight, like he said, eight thousand connections. That's actually not crazy. I mean, that's I yeah, think that might be part of the problem. Is it's, if that's over the course of more than a day, yeah. that's so small as to be. I, th I, I if think it's in it, a day. That's almost one every ten seconds. So that's maybe something, but it's not. Enough to yeah, I mean, I de it's definitely about. enough that it would annoy me, and I understand where he's coming from, but it's not big enough yeah. where I think these guys are going to get off if there's their only, butt. If there's only one person doing that to you, then, <laughs> then I don't know where you live on the internet, but I live in a worse neighborhood or something. <laughs> So like if I if I'm not if I'm not seeing <laughs> you know a hundred IPs doing that to me all the time, then yeah, then I'm like, why is this box not getting internet traffic? <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I have a great advice other than keep but trying honestly, to get through the ISP, though. I would look though. at the upstream of the place in Cyprus rather than your upstream. Uh, so, yeah, if the ISP in Cyprus won't answer, try going one level above them. Uh, but in general, what you're seeing isn't bad enough to warrant someone higher up getting involved. Yeah. Uh, and it's definitely not a cybercrime. Right. Trying to make HTTP connections is really not a cyber crime. Yeah. Uh, so I would say that, uh, you know, don't worry about it so much. Uh, block it and forget it. All right, next email uh, comes in. I know both of you are wired guys. We like to go wired whenever possible, but, but Marlene writes in with an event Wi-Fi setup recommendation question. Hi, Alan and Chris. Mm -hmm. I'm organizing an inaugural tech event, about 100 to 150 people at most. The venue is set up on three floors of the same building. The problem the, oh, I'm sorry. The bottom floor has the largest room and the registration area. The two other floors have two to three classrooms. All rooms will be used for sessions. The venue has been used for tech events before, but usually I have someone like Steep House come in to make their own Wi-Fi uh, since they can't usually handle tech events on their own. However, we can't afford Steep House, not for our first year. So what would you recommend for an inexpensive, reliable Wi-Fi in terms of equipment and arrangement? I believe there are Ethernet jacks for connecting access points to the upstream provider, but it would be helpful to have a wireless fallback solution as well for areas that just don't have Ethernet. Thanks, Marlene. What do you think, Alan? I really don't know enough about wireless to recommend something, uh, but... Um, one thing they did in Malta at uh, EuroBSDCon was have two completely separate Wi-Fi networks. One was like G at 2.4 gigahertz and one was N at 5 gigahertz. Oh, I like that. Uh, and that by trying to, just by splitting the number of people in half, you just meant you could use both. Uh, basically, radio is a shared medium, so only one person can never be talking at once. So whatever speed you have is divided by the number of people on the network because uh, you have to share time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so by just having two separate domains of that, you're getting twice the speed. Uh, yeah. So that helps. Uh, that's one thing that you can do, and beyond that, um, you know, yeah, you like know who say, might have an answer. Know, I don't know anything about equipment at all. Friend of the show, Jed. Uh, he's uh, in the TechSnap subreddit, uh, and uh, we bumped into him at Linux Fest Northwest, uh -huh. and we interviewed them and talked about their Wi-Fi setup for events that to help oh, you do okay. testing. So you, you yes, might check uh, out Candela that. Networks, was yep, it? yep. Yeah. So you might be able to get point in the direction for that. Uh, I'm I'm with Alan. I would say. I uh, get tools like Wi-Fi analyzer. I mean, uh, to be honest with you, what I'd like to be able to say is, well, something like Aruba Networks, where you could have uh, one controller and then you put APs on each area that you can get coverage, and then they'll connect to each other over Ethernet and dynamically adjust each other's antennas, so that way there's just the right amount of crossover, but not too much. Like that would be ideal, but I don't think you have that option. And I don't know what uh, what kind yeah, of budget you have for hardware, especially yeah, buying hardware. You might look at see if there's some place that will rent you hardware, but that seems yeah. like a really niche area renting out Wi-Fi equipment. Yeah, and, and the thing is you could do it with Tomato and DDWRT and do like WDS, but that's that's going to be maybe iffy and you won't know until it's in production and then you're really kind of at a point. Yeah, and that's the other thing. Unless you have the hardware from Candela to be able to simulate having 200 people yeah. on the Wi-Fi, yeah. you won't know what it's going to be like. Because Wi-Fi is horrible for, you know, oh, it was working great and then you know, a couple more people come in the room and it just falls over. Uh, Silver51 in the chat room recommends the D-Link DAP 2590s is not bad. Uh, 
But uh, this is going to be a challenge. I mean, this is an area that Wi-Fi still struggles with. Yeah. It's kind of interesting that the venue doesn't have their own Wi-Fi cheap. system already. They're cheap. Ah, make them break it, it in. It can happen. Yeah. yeah. All right. Next email comes from Biggie. He says, uh, hello, guys, and thanks for the excellent show. I've been asked to give a recommendation about a server setup for a local kindergarten. I'm no computer whiz, but I'm pretty savvy when it comes to this tech stuff, and I've been using GNU Linux for about three years. I was thinking about setting up an Ubuntu server as a host machine and install two virtual Ubuntu servers on it. The first one would be a Samba file server for the photos and data. The second, an Apache web server for own cloud. I'm curious if you would recommend me to a different way of going. Also, what kind of machine setup would you recommend? This kindergarten has about six XP machines, which he wants to recommend they switch to Edubuntu on, in each classroom, along with maybe four other Windows 7 computers. The main problem is having one place to store photos and documents each class takes. Right now, it's saved on each of the XP computers. Thanks again for your help, and keep up the good work. I really love Unfiltered, by the way. Thanks. Regards, Biggie from Iceland. Yeah, well, definitely having... Uh, a shared network drive accessible on all the machines to store images and stuff on. If for no other reason, just make it easier to back them yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, he could do that with a Samba share and then just point on cloud at that Samba share. And then yeah. they, they would have a good way to look at the photos yeah, from all the machines. He didn't really list what their requirements were to know how to tell them what to do. But generally what he's proposing seems reasonable. Although, so I don't know, can, can kindergarten kids actually make pictures and save them to the oh, right drive and well, stuff. You like, bet. I, 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 don't, I don't have much uh, familiarity with oh, sure. kindergarten um, age kids. And I would say... When uh, I was in kindergarten, we didn't have computers. Something else he could do is... Um, in, in grade one, I used a computer with a trackball and a program called Super Stamper. You could... Yeah, I'm not... And you could pick from different stamps and stamp and when then I was, it out on dot matrix. <laughs> when I was that age... When I was in that grade, computers didn't have mice, that's for sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it is hard to relate. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, there were computers, though, uh, just not very good ones. Um, mm-hmm. But I would say uh, I really like what he's got going here. I think if you didn't – I think – here's what I love is you could do this Ubuntu server. You could, have, you could have NFS and Samba going on it. So all of the workstations you switch over to Edge Ubuntu, just do a persistent NFS mount. It's like they boot up and they mount this NFS share and the, you know just tell the students and teachers, this is the folder you save your files to. Well, that folder would be on the NFS share. You point your own cloud to that, so then when they want to go view them, everybody just goes to the own cloud URL, and you could, it'll it'll browse the folder structure. You could set up a folder hierarchy in there for the different rooms or different whatevers. Um, I've used Edge Ubuntu in schools. I think it's a great way to go, especially replacing those XP machines. And it, it you know it does a really good job of uh, sort of being preloaded with a good selection and a good theme for schools. So I, I don't know, I uh, Biggie, I think you got it here and. Uh, I'd kind of like to hear about the setup once you have it done, how it goes for you. I don't know about the two virtual machines. That seems a little overkill, but if you just want the isolation, I suppose that's fine. Yeah. Um, um, I can understand kind of wanting to separate the PHP own cloud app from yeah. the file server, but if it's going to serve the files from the file server, you don't want to have to copy right. have two VMs with the same files. Yeah. Uh, I know that's a backup, but if it's on the same physical machine, that's not a backup. Well, and I wonder how powerful the machine is, because the budget, you know, with the, when I see XP computers like this, the first thing that comes to mind is maybe a lower budget, and so then is it, yeah. you know, is it an i7? Does it have enough memory? Does it do VTXD? All those kinds of things. Uh, yeah. And if the answer uh, is no if, along if those you're lines... Just using, what, if you're reusing one of the old XP machines, I would just put everything on the base OS yeah. and not virtualize anything. You could use containers. You don't, if you don't, yeah, if you don't have the hardware virtualization offload stuff and a decent amount of RAM... Once yep. you get into virtualization, bad things can happen. Yep, yep, yep. All right, Biggie, good luck. All right, next email comes from Andrew. And Al, I don't know if we have an answer to this, but this has crossed my mind too. Okay, he says, hello, Alan and Chris. You guys keep saying that the BSD, open BSD guys, knew about the memory allocator problem sometime before the whole Heartbleed thing came out. So a little backup, we're talking about Heartbleed here, and we're talking about that OpenSSL had its own dedicated memory allocator. Uh, so he says, my question is this. Why didn't the OpenBSD project contact the OpenSSL guys, and why not join that project to help them influence the production? I'm just wondering why they did this instead of just doing, why didn't they do this instead of doing a fork? Could have prevented a fork, uh, and they just, I think he's asking, like, if they knew ahead of time, why didn't they say something? Well, they knew that the memory allocator stopped their mitigation stuff from working. Now, the OpenSSL guys knew that already, and they did it, uh, like... The custom memory allocator in OpenSSL is still there. It wasn't the cause of the part bleed. It just made it worse. Right. And it's still there, done exactly the same way, and they don't plan on changing it. 
And that is why the OpenBSD guys did a fork. The, the custom memory allocator is there because OpenSSL wants to work on every platform, including little embedded devices and CPUs that don't have all the features and running on weird OSs like, uh, you know, OpenSSL, I, I'm fairly sure, still has support for running on NetWare, which nobody has used in a long time. <laughs> uh, and and old versions of Windows and stuff. And, and so it has all this, this compatibility stuff stuck in it. And the OpenBSD forks idea is get rid of all of that and make a version that's more secure and only uses the, new, the, the most modern programming practices to prevent some of these bugs from being possible. Right, yeah, because it wasn't just one thing. It wasn't just the memory allocator either. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, the memory allocator in OpenSSL, the custom one, is still there, and there's no plan to change that. Yeah. Even yeah. though it's bad. <laughs> LibreSSL, where are you? No, all right. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, there's, a, there's a separate story. I, we didn't have time to really look at it, but... Uh, you know, there's some a uh, bunch of porting projects have popped up about porting OpenSS or uh, LibreSSL to other operating systems. Yeah, and some of them are not realizing that um, the some of the code they took out of uh, OpenSSL when they made LibreSSL uh, was dealing with when certain OSs don't have certain features, uh, especially dealing with uh, generating random numbers and the memory allocator. Well, the the implementation that OpenBSD has of like the memory allocator, of it, the operating system level memory allocator, does a bunch of things like when you free RAM, it overwrites it. Mm -hmm. Well, LibreSSL assumes that you have your that memory there. allocator does that. Yeah. If you just port it to Linux and the allocator, memory allocator doesn't do that, all of a sudden you're not overwriting the data when you're freeing it. Not good. And if something assumes... And so if, if you're porting it to another OS without understanding what... Features it's depending on from OpenSSL or from OpenBSD, you might end up actually making an insecure version of OpenSSL. You might have a bad time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, while they're glad to see people are interested in getting it ported to other OSs, uh, you have to be careful. You can't ju don't just use some port on GitHub because some guy says it works. Kids, don't just Doesn't go willy nilly it's... using different SSLs. Yeah, uh, you you definitely want to pick one that's been uh, sorted out properly. Yeah. All right, Michael writes. So in. yeah, I guess in in general that they. Uh, they didn't tell OpenSSL about the memory allocator because it's not technically wrong, although it is. They don't bad consider it practice. a flaw necessarily. Yeah, uh, yeah. OpenSSL wouldn't change it and doesn't right. consider it to be a problem. Yeah. All right. Michael writes in Hello, Alan and Chris. Love the show. Keep up the great work because of this podcast. I don't feel. I don't hate my drive and traffic as much. He's in Los Angeles. I finally got rid of my iPhone and got a Samsung S5, my second Android device, my first one being the Nexus 7 tablet. As much as I hated iTunes and its leggy interface, it worked pretty good for podcasts. My laptop would download my streams and then sync with my iPhone. Uh, the phone didn't have to deal with the downloads at all, and my podcasts were always synced. So if I watched them on my computer, I would just start where I left off and vice versa. On my S5, I started using Dogcatcher as my podcast manager. It was fine, but I'd like to use something else where I can use my computer and download and sync with my S5. Um, uh, I see something about the torrent feeds, but uh, Matt... Matt B. Use, I think he typed with that. Uh, he, says, he says, maybe I can use something else to sync, something else to download. What do you guys think? And by the way... Alan, get ready for this. He has over 30 podcasts in his feed. TechSnap in the number one spot in BSD Now in his top five. So he says, nice. thanks very much. Alan, look at you. Uh, I have a couple ideas for this. Okay, because I don't because I don't <laughs> listen to podcasts anymore. Well, and you really don't uh, listen to podcasts even, even, on your phone even if you did listen to podcasts. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> so, when, you know, when I did, it was usually video podcasts only. And yeah. I, so I'd watch them on my TV or my computer. Right. Uh, and I just haven't had time lately i will recommend first if if you just want to go like with an app on the phone which probably like the majority of people i don't think michael does but the majority of people a dog catcher is good i like pocket cast and one of the reasons i like pocket cast is it does server side rss feed refreshing and when you have like as many podcast uh, feeds as michael does waiting for your phone to refresh 30 feeds especially when guys host their feed like on super slow servers uh, it is so obnoxious. So the nice thing about Pocket Cast is it does do the server side refresh, and then when you open up the app, it immediately is. It, it just as soon as you open it, it knows what episodes are new. Pocket Cast also offers syncing 
uh, between Android devices, not to any desktop component. Now, get ready for this. I've got a solution for you. It's crazy. It doesn't quite do the time code sync, but I think it could rock. And you have two ways you could do it. One is implement Subsonic, which is maybe a little overkill. Or number two, try out a script called Bash Potter if you got Linux or um, G Potter for any other operating system. Point that to uh, a folder to do all the downloads, and and then. Get ready for this. Use BitTorrent Sync to point at that folder, fire up BitTorrent Sync on your phone, and just pull down the episodes you want and then use it on any media player you want on Android. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but BitTorrent the BitTorrent Sync seems like it'd be a fairly large drain on your battery. Well, you don't. So like that's going to use a lot of CPU the, or something. So the way the BitTorrent Sync on the Android works is uh, it won't always be syncing. You open up the app. It will first get a directory list of the contents. It won't still sync anything. It just gets the list, and then you just tell it which files to pull. Uh, and it's surprisingly right, it seems, fast. As opposed to an HTTP transfer, it just seems like BitTorrent is a lot more overhead as far right. as CPU is concerned. But And every bit of CPU is battery on your phone. The, but if you're only syncing when it's uh, plugged yeah. in or docked or whatever... Then well, no, it, it, it only syncs when the app's open. And it goes really quick. Right, I just mean, uh, from a user perspective, if you're most of the, if, if the time you do the syncing of your podcast to your phone is when it's plugged in, oh, uh, yeah. then it's not a big deal that it might be using more... CPU power than doing it a different way. So like uh, right here, I have the Unfilter Supporter Show, and uh, I could I could back up. I've got different I've got different podcast directories here in BitTorrent Sync. And what's cool about this is when you just tap the file, it immediately starts pulling it down and then just sends it to whatever player you want. Now I know this is a little this is a little of a roundabout way to do it. But the it has Como the, in the chat room says he uses G Potter. Yep, G Potter. Would, you could do that instead of Bash Potter. Uh, but uh, the nice thing about Bash Potter is uh, it's just really just set at once and just runs in the background and it generates playlist files and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then the thing is, is you could listen on the on the desktop because they're already on your folder, or listen on the mobile device. It won't sync the time, yep. but it's kind of nice. There's that's a lot of ways thing. to I'm do it. I'm spoiled by the Audible app. Yes, because uh, that's what I use for. Uh, books on tape, which is right. what I usually do instead of uh, podcasts. Well, and if he wanted to just listen between his Nexus Seven and his S Five, Pocket Cast would do that. It would sync. It can. Mm -hmm. It can sync state between two Android devices, which is kind of cool when you think about like how um, the Fire TV could also be one of the Pocket Cast devices, so you could listen on your home sound system, and it would work for video shows like TechSnap. And you could watch it on your Nexus 7, pause it in Pocket Cast, open up Pocket Cast on the Fire TV, and it would resume right where you left off. So there's a couple ways to yeah. do it. But uh, I, I've, I do it with Subsonic right now. I don't use Bash Potter. I use Subsonic to download my podcast. They all go into one directory, and then whichever device I'm on the day, I just pull it down. So there you go. All right, Tom's got a real first world problem. Maybe we can help him solve. Maybe we can't. He says, hey, guys, I just watched TechSnap 1.6, and I heard Alan talking about his home broadband upgrade to Gigabit Fiber. Lucky me. I have it right now at home, but I have no good way of testing it. I do like most people, and I use speedtest.net, but this gives me very inconsistent results. I see between 80 and 980 megabits. Are there any better options? I can't find any neutral third-party service to use for testing, and I'd like to have one. Thanks for doing the show, Tom. He's got a real problem here, Alan. He just can't yeah, test well, that. Well, part of it is, is obviously you have to test from different locations on speedtest.net, and if you're getting wildly different numbers from the same server on speedtest.net, that's one thing. But if you know if you get a gigabit from the place uh, a couple blocks away or whatever, and only 80 megabits when you pull from a Europe instead of North America, that actually does, you know, tell you some information. Um, speedtest.net is pretty good, and they have a lot of servers, and uh, they're very worried about the accuracy of the results. Uh, really? The so you don't think he's it. just not too fast? Like maybe they can't handle well, the Well, yes. Uh, obviously, the, <clears throat> the servers there, uh, they only demand that the testing servers have a gigabit connection themselves. So your speed could be severely limited by the people. Uh, I see. So if somebody else is banging on it. At the same time, then yeah, it can cause a problem. Very good. Uh, so sometimes it might be just tested at a different time of the day and stuff, but yeah, it's hard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The only other way, really, is to have a, a proper server to test from that you, where you know that its connection is not going to be the issue. Slaver, I, I use a tool uh, called iPerf. Yeah, I was going to say Slaver in the chat room is saying uh, use uh, DigitalOcean and iPerf. But aren't most of the, the $5 VM is only connected at 100 megabits, isn't it? Uh, you'd have to check. I don't know. I don't know. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure the $5 one's only 100 megabits, so that wouldn't help much. <laughs> Uh, yeah, if you're doing it, yeah, if you're do, if you're trying to do a, a gigabit, I'm not sure about that though. Could you'd have to double check. Could always throw it on one of the higher end ones too. 
Uh, all right, last one comes in from the subreddit, links.techsnap.tv from Metanova. And this is just kind of a funny story. It says, my ISP is one of those companies that thought the, the modem router combos was a good idea. The main problem was that they had a password on the admin interface and I needed to forward my ports. Poking at the router a bit, I found it was running Telnet. Using a tool on Backtrack Live Environment, I managed to find where a user, where where the quote-unquote user account, which I believe was just user, with the password of quote-unquote user, so it's user, user to log in. I could log in the web interface with this, but only allowed me to perform some minor diagnostic tasks. Tasks. I logged into the router via Telnet using that user and found myself at some sort of limited shell that didn't even have LS or any use like BusyBox stuff that you'd be able to find on embedded machines. Mm-hmm. However, typing help listed a few commands that seemed to have the same function as the limited web interface. I then typed password, and to my surprise, it responded with like password space user giving me an example of what to type. So I typed password space root and it prompted me to enter a new password for the root user. I set my own password, logged out, and found I was able to log into the web interface using my new root credentials. Mm -hmm. (laughs) This presented an interface with many more options. I then turned off NAT, connected my own router to the ISP's one, and was able to open all the ports I wanted. He says, easiest privilege escalation ever? I think so. (laughs) It's a pretty good story. Yeah. Thanks, Betanova. Oh, uh, Telnet. And then one last little thing for the community. Uh, if you're a Coda Radio fan or a Jupiter Broadcasting Swag fan, go to teespring.com slash CR100. We have a limited time Coda Radio 100, just like we did for the TechSnap show. We're doing a commit level of 100, which we've already reached. So these are shipping, uh, but you can still buy it now for one week and four days as a way to celebrate Coda Radio 100. We've got the hoodie, we've got the T-shirt, and the ladies' tee. Uh, I'm really digging the colors uh this time around there's some i like that dark navy blue hoodie and that dark red one what's that do they have a name for that dark one maroon oh maroon looks mm-hmm. good and then uh the uh the uh, red looks really great i think and the orange looks really great on the t-shirt so go over to teespring.com orange slash is a good 100. Much, but the red looks nice yeah that orange pops doesn't it yeah, yeah. It, it really pops out teespring.com slash cr100 to celebrate 100 episodes of coda radio now uh mr jude all you have to do is just take 62 weeks off and Michael Dominic will have caught up with you. <laughs> right. <laughs> but he also, 100, 100 episodes without missing a beat. So I think he was I'm inspired. i sabotage by, him. He was inspired by the TechSnap show. Teespring.com slash CR100. We have one week and four days left to buy as of this recording. This will be coming out next week, though. So by the time you see this, it's like four days left. You're going to have like yeah. very little time. Uh, so grab it while you can teespring.com slash CR100 alright Mr. Jude with the news all done that means it's time for the TechSnap Roundup Welcome to the TechSnap Roundup. Yeah, that's what that crazy music means. Now, the Roundup for stories that just didn't quite fit at the top of the show, but we still want to give you some links to read up on your own after the show. And a lot of these links came from our subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. And I'm happy to report... Our first story is potentially a little bit of good news in this whole net neutrality thing that's been going down. A quote-unquote huge coalition led by Amazon, Microsoft, and others are taking a stand against the FCC's new net neutrality fast lane proposal. Uh, so just to count it off, right now the big names in this group are, I said, I said a couple of them, it's Amazon, we got eBay, we got Facebook, we got Google, Microsoft, Netflix, Twitter, and Yahoo have all authored this joint letter Uh, The letter doesn't explicitly mention a course of action they'd like to see the FCC take, like calling on the FCC to regulate Internet service providers as utilities. But it does mark the first time that all of these influential tech companies have come together. And actually, it's the first time Amazon has made any formal stance on record at all on the issue, which I didn't realize. Um, Well, because their cloud thing is one of the ones that's being bullied by Comcast. And so uh, if you're on Comcast, certain services that use Amazon EC2 or s three uh, have performance issues. Well, you know what's kind of crazy is the day this episode comes out will be May 15th, which is the day that this new fast lane proposal is being considered. So this episode airs on that day. So we'll be watching and we'll collect all of the information we can and give you guys the best analysis wherever it fits in the show uh, after on the, on the following episode. But it is definitely an uphill climb, and I'm really glad to hear some of these big names get on board, especially yeah. since they've handled some of the recent that, stuff. That it's not just Netflix that doesn't want uh, the fast lane thing to happen because it'll cost them money. It's everyone doesn't want this to happen. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Alan, we got a story that uh, involves benchmarks and compilers. What's yep. going on? Oh, my. 
Yeah, uh, so this is a post from Brendan Gregg, who's uh, one of the guys that developed Dtrace and is a big guy in performance measuring and cloud stuff. And he says, uh, compilers love to mess with your benchmark. <laughs> so avoid comparing the wrong thing. Okay. Uh, so he said, uh, a lot of people have been uh, spinning, when they spin up their VM, they run a benchmark on it mm -hmm. and decide if the VM is on a, is on a, a busy machine. So basically they found that uh, when they spun up a bunch of VMs, sometimes some of them would be much slower than others, suggesting they were on a machine where a bunch of other busy VMs were and, it was, and there was just not enough free CPU time. Sure. Uh, and so a lot of people have taken to running a benchmark uh, when they get the virtual machine deciding whether they want that or if they should throw it out and try to get a different one. Uh, but he says part of the problem could be that they're actually not benchmarking what they think they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of those benchmarks use a tool called Unix Bench, and depending on your compiler flags, you can get wildly different answers out of it, mostly because it was designed back when Solaris 2 was a thing, <laughs> and, and it was like, oh, if you have GCC 2.7, do this. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah. Uh, and one of the interesting things was just knowing the, how big of a difference the version of GCC can make. Mm. Depending what OS is on your VM, uh, like an older Red Hat, We'll have GCC, like Red, uh, CentOS 5, is that anything? We'll have GCC 4.1.2 from 2008 versus uh, CentOS 6 would have uh, 4.8.2 from 2013. Jeez. And obviously, there's been some advances in compiler technology in that five year span there. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, resulting in the exact same machine having wildly different performance. Right. Or if you use Ubuntu, uh, you'll actually get 4.6.3. Hey oh. Yeah. And so we tested two machines with exactly the same uh, hardware and found that using GCC 4.1.2 versus 4.6.3 uh, resulted in a very big difference. Uh, basically, 10 million points on the benchmark. Whoa. So a difference with, uh, the one server got 25 million points and the other got 35 million points and their same machine was just with the different OS installed. Hmm. Or a different version of GCC using well, yeah, it for yeah, the benchmark. Yeah. Huh. And then, you know, it goes on to talk about a lot more stuff like that and how you can avoid some of the problems. But yeah, that's one of the interesting things is if you're gonna benchmark do it uh, right. Even just if you're even if you're just doing if you're say for Onyx and you want to do a benchmark between CentOS and Ubuntu, you want to make sure you're using exactly the same version of GCC on both. That makes a lot uh, of otherwise, sense. Otherwise, uh, your benchmark <laughs> number is going to be benchmarking the compiler. And not necessarily the machine or the uh, OS. Um, when we were when we were moving over to JB1 and looking at different hardware to perform encoding, we initially just took the blunt approach of take the same file, load it on each computer, start it off, and see which one has a faster frames per second encode rate. And then we pretty quickly realized, wait a minute, this one has a newer version of X264. This one has an older version. Surprise, surprise, the newer version is performing quite a bit better. Uh, and and then and it was also like, like if you're if you're doing that on FreeBSD, if you're compiling FFmpeg or whatever, you'll when you do it from the source, you'll see that most of them have an option to compile to do uh, processor specific optimizations. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, most of the binary packages won't have that, so that it'll work no matter what your processor is. Right. So you might get better performance by actually compiling, building it. Uh, your your some of those tools yourself and specifically tailoring them to the specific machine to get even more performance out of them. Word down word. My, the uh, the former Gen 2 user in me hears you, man. Hears you. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Uh, this one's for you, iOS 7 users. Uh, researcher Andrew, Andreas Kurtz, I guess as I'd probably say his name, discovered this issue. He claims, and he says he's verified it by restoring an iPhone 4 device to the most recent iOS 7.1 and 7.11, that the email attachments being stored on the iOS device are not encrypted. Uh, this uh, initial test configuration, he shut down the device and it was able to access the file system after having it plugged into a machine and enabling DFU mode. Um, he mounted the iOS data partition, navigated the actual email folder on the file system, and just saw the file sitting there on the drive. Now, this does not affect uh, emails in transit. It only affects emails sitting on the device. And Apple is right, aware of email it. Email in transits aren't encrypted anyway. Like Unless, there's, there's transport encryption yeah. to the server, yeah. but... Obviously, yeah. it's not encrypted in den because the person on the other end doesn't. But it, it uh, so I, iPhones are supposed to have this encryption option, and it means that if you have sensitive attachments on your phone that you assumed were encrypted, mm, no. Yeah. So yeah, basically, yeah. If you're assuming that if my phone gets stolen, people won't be able to access my uh, attachments, turns out, right? Actually, they can. Yes. Yes. 
All right, Al. Now, did you put a Mac OS X item in the roundup? Is this the first time? I did because I was talking to the developer. Oh, okay. Did it. So a first kind of- in 162 weeks, Alan. What do we have? Your Mac OS X and native SSH agent notifications, huh? Yes. Yeah, so this is a, an explanation of how the SSH agent built into Mac OS X works. And then going on to expand on that uh, to make it notify you every time your key is used while you're on the machine. Oh, that's cool. So you get you mm-hmm. uses the built-in OS system to do the little notification thingy. Yeah, and uh, basically allows you to do a bunch of stuff so that every time something tries to access your key via the SSH agent, you can always allow that host, deny it, or allow it. That's and cool. And that way you can uh, have better control over which... Because currently, once the agent starts and you decrypt your key, anything on the machine can access it, and that might not be what you want. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, uh, using, but doing it in a way that's integrated into Mac OS X so that it's not sludgy and looking out of place. Yeah, anytime these kind of notifications information can be integrated into your existing workflow, then the more visibility you have and the actual, you know, the better it actually is at of aw- making you aware of these things. If if you have to go, see the problem, like the reason why I like this a lot is on the Mac, you would have to go to the console application and then go dig through the logs and users, like there's nothing in the OS that kind of pushes you in that direction. But if you just integrate with something that users already have their eye on, I think that's pretty slick. I like it. All right, well, we all know antivirus uh, company guys go out there and push antivirus, try to scare you into buying it. Well, not the semantic, Chief. Uh, Get this. He says antivirus software now only catches 45% of malware attacks, and it's dead. That's according to a senior manager at Symantec. The remarks were made by Brian Dye, a senior vice president for information security at the company. Dye told the Wall Street Journal that hackers increasingly use novel methods and the bugs in software computers to perform the attacks, resulting in about 55% of cyber attacks going unnoticed by commercial antivirus software. Now, of course, yeah. Symantec is going to try to pivot. Uh, you know, they're going to yeah, detect... they have an intrusion prevention and intrusion detection software yep. that they sold to Target and other people. They're moving to and the detect and respond sector. it actually did work. It actually did work for Target. Right. Target yeah. just ignored the <laughs> fact that it did. Oh, Target. Oh, Target, that's Hall of Shame worthy. If somebody submits that to the subreddit, I'm just saying it might be Hall of Shame worthy. Uh, so there you go. Uh, antivirus is dead, according to Symantec. And you know what? I agree. Now, uh, there's an update on that story. They're saying that uh, a bunch of other people in the antivirus community have come up and said, hey, ours still works. <laughs> well, I and, well, uh, And even Symantec <clears throat> saying they still recommend people use it. It's still catching 45% of well, the stuff. Yeah. I mean, but they're going to that... focus on... on the more active threat where they can do more good. Yeah, he left that wiggle room in there. There's, they're basically, the what an antivirus can do while still being an antivirus, we pretty much got to as good as we can get. All we could do is keep updating the definitions. Uh, but in order to catch the newer types of attack, we need a new kind of product, an, an intrusion prevention or detection rather than just an antivirus. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right, our next one in the roundup is a PDF yes. from an author that we've, we've talked about before. Yeah, this is uh, James Mickens. He was just at uh, Monitorama, which is a monitoring conference. Monitorama. Uh, and he gave a, a talk. He gave the, um, we, we featured the paper that he wrote um, on a previous episode of TechSnap. And if you remember, it was the one about, um, uh, about how cryptography is kind of separated from the actual application. And we see all these interesting papers about cryptography and how they have nothing to do with that, how people could ever actually use that cryptography. Mm. And that how if you're being was sodded upon. There's not much you can do about it. Uh, and there were some pictures from that that came out of that conference and it reminded me of, and uh, I was directed to a page where it shows a bunch more of his uh, great papers. James is also a researcher in the distributed systems group at Microsoft. Yeah, so he has a whole bunch of very academic papers on really cool technology he's working on, including one for like doing distributed parallel disk access on Windows or something. It looked Ooh. really interesting. Uh, but he also has a series of very funny ones he did for Usenix. Uh, and I've linked uh, a couple of those just because they're so hilarious. Um, and uh, I just wish I could write like he does. Yeah. The first one was The Night Watch. Yeah. And this one, uh, he kind of talks about, um, you know, as a highly trained academic researcher, he spends a lot of time trying to advance the frontiers of human knowledge and so on. But it gets down to... Um, Picking his team for the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> and it's got great quotes like, I believe but not, cannot prove that PHP developers do have souls. <laughs> no. 
Yes, and then he goes on and make stuff about making fun of GUI developers and stuff. Uh, but he says that I can realistically give a kernel hacker a nickname like Diamondback or Zeus Hammer. <laughs> In contrast, no one has ever said these semi-transparent icons are really semi-transparent. This is the work of Zeus Hammer. <laughs> <laughs> and just hilarious things like that. It's it's just a very funny paper about uh, you know talking about how um, systems engineers have to deal with some of the worst stuff ever, and so that would make them good to have in your gang after yeah. the zombie apocalypse. Yeah, actually, uh, I know we got another one, but our next roundup is kind of about that. Seventy nine percent of IT administrators want to quit due to stress. So we're couching the bad story between two funny stories because this one's a bit of a downer. Uh, this is according to results of the GFI Software's third annual IT admin stress survey conducted by Opinion Matters. Fully 79% of IT staff are effectively considering leaving their jobs due to stress, relate, uh, stress related to the job. This is a significant increase from 2013 when just 57% of respondents said they were considering leaving. The survey consisted of 200 U.S. IT administrators and also found that 38% of the IT staff missed social functions due to issues at work and 35% have missed time with their families due to work demands on their personal time. One quarter of respondents said that they've seen a relationship severely damaged uh, or fail due to the job. It goes yeah, on with a uh, lot of other really bad stats, too. That <laughs> yeah. Uh, basically, if you're not doing a lot of your maintenance stuff proactively, then stuff's going to break in the middle of the night all the time, and yeah. it's going to kill you. And it's it's safe to assume you will always be underfunded, understaffed. And there is this really weird stress when so much of the business function, the, abil the, ab the ability of the business to keep the lights on, to generate revenue, essentially rides on the group of maybe a small group, a large group, or maybe one person in a company. And there is a weird way that can eat at you even when you don't realize it is. And you have to be able to acknowledge that and manage that stress in order to do your job effectively. And like Alan said, it really comes down to the maintenance, the documentation, all the stuff you hate doing, the ticket management, all that stuff, is it plays a key role in helping you mitigate that stress, keep that stress level down and stay on top of this stuff. Um, yep. Because, yeah, I hate seeing these things. And, you know, it, it was hard for me when I was in corporate IT. And it's one of the reasons I went off into contracting and, and did my own thing is because uh, it, it is it can be a very hard, life-sucking job. But you, there are ways to make it not suck so bad. Yeah. All right. Our next roundup is another funny uh, James paper. Yes, from uh, uh, paper. James Mickens. Uh, and, and it's got some great quotes in it, too. Uh, but even just the opening just tells you that this is an article you're going to want to finish reading. According to my Since dad, flying in the airplane used to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you could smoke on the plane and smoking was good for you. <laughs> Everybody was attractive. There were no fees for anything. Right. And there was so much legroom you could orient your body in arbitrary and profane directions without bothering anyone. <laughs> and you could eat caviar and manatee steak <laughs> as you were showered with piles of money that were personally distributed by JFK and the Beach Boys. <laughs> Times are good, assuming that you are a white man in the advertising business, <laughs> which my father was not, so perhaps I should ask him some follow-up questions, but I digress. <laughs> yeah. uh, but there's just so much great stuff, and it kind of talks about uh, massive, um, how we shifted in, in, when we, in designing CPUs from more and more clock speed to having more and more cores. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, um, they have some... It says, of course, lay people do not actually spend their time trying to invert massive hash values while rendering nine copies of the Avatar Planet in 1080p. Lay people use their computers for precisely 10 things, none of which involve massive com computational parallelism, <laughs> and seven of which involve procuring a vast menagerie of pornographic data and then curating that data using a variety of fairly obvious management techniques, <laughs> like the creation of a folder called Work Stuff, which contains an inner <laughs> folder called More Work Stuff, where more work stuff contains a series of ostensible documentary, uh, documentary, documentaries that describe the economic interactions between two people uh, who don't have enough money to pay for pizza and people who aren't too bothered by that fact. <laughs> <laughs> this is really great. Yes. Thus, John says, imagine a world which... Uh, uh, imagine a world in which we're constantly executing millions of parallel tasks... It was equivalent to saying, imagine a world that you and I will never live in. <laughs> yeah. And it goes on and on. Hey, at least we have Turbo Boost now. Yeah, and there's and there's lots of uh, great chunks, like sentences in all caps. <laughs> yeah, I've noticed in this right now. Yes. Uh, it's 
This was the it's worst idea ever. Yeah. Yeah. Today, if a person uses a desktop or a laptop, she is justifiably angry if she discovers that her machine is doing non-trivial amounts of work. If her disk is active for more than a second per hour, or if her CPU utilization goes over 4%, she either has a computer virus or she has made the disastrous decision to run a Java program. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. That's a good find, Alan. That's yes. Find. Uh, and he's got a whole bunch more there. If you just go to the uh, research at Microsoft.com, uh, people Mickens there, he's got a whole list of his academic and humorous papers. And Alan has but, a couple uh, of his favorites so, linked in the roundup. Yeah. Uh, it's so funny. All right. So this next thing's kind of funny, too. This 1988 Video Privacy Protection Act is biting Hulu in the... In the Wop, wop. Uh, what's going on with this story? Yeah, so back in 88, they passed a law saying that uh, stores you went and rented VHSs from couldn't disclose to other people which movies you had rented, right? As a privacy thing. Yeah. It's just like, you know, the library doesn't tell what books right. you borrow. Yeah. Uh, well, that law still applies, and, and uh, somebody's suing Hulu's claiming it applies to Hulu, and that Hulu leaking or telling their advertisers which movies you rented to tailor ads to you mm -hmm. is violating your privacy. Yeah, and Hulu tried to get this uh, suit dismissed in December, last December, but the judge the judge declined, meaning the case is set to go to trial. This actually, yeah, this yeah. actually needs to be heard so we can decide whether Hulu is uh, should be, if this should apply to them or not. I remember Netflix wanted this law changed too because they wanted you to be able to do watch parties over Facebook. Do you remember, about, do you remember yeah. hearing about this? Yeah, same yes. thing. Although, if you choose to do it, I think it would be okay. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's when Hulu is giving the data to advertisers without ever asking if you were okay right. with it. Yeah. That's the issue. Yeah. Huh. Doesn't YouTube do that too, though? Probably, although that's... Not paid You're content. not renting a movie yeah, off right. YouTube. Right. Whereas, like, YouTube is free, right? So you're not renting the movie from YouTube. Right. Uh, with Hulu, you're paying for access to specific content. All right, next story in the roundup. Hey, maybe we got uh, an answer to, to our sloppy password habits. What's this about, Alan? It's, it's uh, Pavlovian password management. Okay. The basic idea is that if users use an insecure password, you make them change it more often. So basically, if users use the typical passwords they would use that are horrible and be cracked easily, make them change their password every three days. Huh. And then the longer, the better their password is, the longer they're... They get to keep uh, it. The, yeah, the longer they get to keep it. Uh, and basically annoy them into using better passwords. <laughs> or beat them senseless, essentially, yeah. with annoyance. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's an interesting thing. Huh. Uh, if you did that, that, would, that might drive up adoption of LastPass by a lot. I, would actually, I actually would like this. I, I support this because I use badass passwords, so it really wouldn't inconvenience me very much. Right. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, hey, buckle up. We got new guidelines for the Popo on what data they can access and now, this is actually kind of an interesting thing because I think it also involves some notification aspects, too, from Apple. And uh, some other companies are doing this as well. But what, what have you ascertained so basically, here, Basically, this, this is an article Apple, or a set of guidelines Apple published so please know what data Apple can, like what they're capable of getting out of a locked phone. Mm. And describing Apple's policy, which actually involves uh, requiring a court order. And the court order and the phone have to be delivered to Apple's headquarters. Uh, Apple's not going to come out to do it for you. <laughs> trying to make it as inconvenient as possible. Yeah, I get the sense that they get requests to do some really crazy arse things. There was a, a statement they had made where it sounded like essentially a lot of the time local law enforcement come to them and say, we want access to all of the things for these people. Can you give yeah. them to us? And it's like, well... And it's like, we don't actually have the phone. Yeah. So can you just remotely hack into their phone? Yeah. And Apple's like, <laughs> no. <you want> crack. <laughs> so now they have guidelines. Oh, good. It's like, this is what Apple says they're actually capable of doing, which is interesting to see as a user what data Apple can just access without your permission. Now, we have another we have another round of blink on the semantic story. Is this a different take? Oh, or? I guess you added the story and I, I added the story. Yeah. We didn't realize we both added the same well, story. Well, it just tells you we both thought it was a good story to catch, right? Yeah, yeah, that's, so yeah we can just skip that. The roundup consists of links that uh, we both wanted to cover. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. But now our next one's a GitHub page. What do we have here, Alan? Yeah. Uh, this is something that actually came up last week. Peacemaker. Uh, Peacemaker. Oh, yeah, peacemaker. hold on, hold on, let me. Peacemaker. Yeah, <laughs> see, I it's for Heartbleed. Uh, oh, I get so, it. Uh, we talked a little bit about last week. You know, most of the Heartbleed uh, server side stuff has been fixed, right? Because anybody that runs a server knows well and has patched their stuff. Right. Uh, 
but it turns out that you can use Heartbleed against the client. So if you're the server, you could actually steal data from the client. We talked a little bit about this being done on against Android devices. Mm. Uh, but here's a proof of concept you can actually use to uh, steal data from a client if the client isn't using a patch version of OpenSSL. So it's important that everybody upgrade, even if you're only using OpenSSL from the client side. Yes, there you go. Right there, we were, that, that answers that. Um, all yes. right, and then our last roundup story is also Heartbleed related, isn't yes. it, Alan? Uh, yeah, so this is uh, from trailofbits.com, and they have why Clang, static analysis, and dynamic analysis tools failed to find Heartbleed. So even though OpenSSL is run through a lot of code checking and tests and stuff, right. uh, n- nothing, no automated system found Heartbleed, and it kind of enumerates a bunch of the different reasons why. Part of it is, you know, things like the custom memory allocator mess with the analysis tools. Mm. That's one of the things that the OpenBSD guys want to change is make it easier for the automated tools to check stuff. Uh, and a bunch of other things in it. It gets into some really gory detail. Uh, so if you understand programming better than me, you will understand this article better than me. <laughs> yeah, there you but go. It, it shows uh, some of the stuff where it's stepping through the code and pointing out, uh, hey, you know, this, this makes an assumption here that you might not have realized. And if that's not true, that could cause the program to do something you didn't want it to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the whole uh, failing uh, automated testing failing aspect of, of Heartbleed yeah. is an interesting angle to that story. Uh, yeah. Very good. Well, guess and what? How different things cause these problems. That right there, Alan, that brings us to the end of this week's Tech Snap. And links yep. to everything we talked about can be found in the show notes. Just go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com, find Tech Snap 162. And about it's all pretty much listed chronologically that we covered it in the show. And don't forget, you can help make the show even better by going to links.techsnap.tv. Now, we had a huge feedback segment this week, so we need your questions. Please, please, please go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com, click that mm-hmm. contact link, choose Tech Snap from that drop down and then send us in any of your systems network or administration questions security hardware we want to hear it networking is always fun all that kind of stuff to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com the contact form or links.techsnap.tv and alan uh we're normally live on a thursday at now my time it's 1 p.m pacific which is 4 p.m eastern 2000 utc Boom, over at jblive.tv for the video version or jblive.info for the audio stream. And Alan, I know you're flying out on Monday as we record this, so have a great trip. Yep. I'm sure um, we'll hear a, a story of how well it went. You'll be back. Uh, so we'll be we'll be off air the way this all day works out next week, but we'll be back the following week. You guys that watch on the download, you'll never see us miss a beat. Yep. There'll be new tech snaps and new BSD nows out uh, while Alan is gone. And then uh, we'll just be right back. Yes, when we get back, show. BSD now should have a whole slew of awesome interviews. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Plus, we'll have lots to talk about, yeah. and uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be a yeah. good set of shows. So, very yeah. good. So, uh, if you're coming out to to BSD Can, make sure you say hi to me and so on. And if you're there Tuesday, uh, the early, basically the day before the the whole thing starts, we're having a little uh, goat birds of feather session. <laughs> uh, there's a whole story behind that. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> if you're around on Tuesday, meet us at the pub and uh, get your picture taken with a goat. <laughs> Nice. There you go. It's, and Alan. Alan's not the goat, yeah. but you could also get yeah. your picture taken with Alan if you want to. Yeah. And the goat. That'd be, that's almost worth the trip right there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning in this week's episode of TechSnap. We'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>